There's a research organization he was working for that was founded upon the fact that all the great inventions in the history of the world have been based on people exploring things for curiosity as opposed to it being a job necessarily. So as much as, you know, this is a job for you guys, I get it, you're working there. But if you don't have that curiosity, the idea of making breakthroughs and kind of you know, going down various rabbit holes and kind of, um, you know, Les in my team refers to it as kind of rat cunning and kind of sniffing things out and kind of going after it and that sort of thing um, is just critical to startup success more broadly, never mind just organizational health. Mark, uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, this is a rogue experiment in having a fireside conversation. Uh, uh, good to hear it. And uh, yeah, really excited to be here. Um, always love hanging out with you guys. It's uh, yeah, one of the funner teams in the portfolio. You guys have a fun culture, so it's always good to get amongst <laughs> it. So um, yeah, fire away. I'm, I'm all yours for the next hour. Uh, one of the first questions I would, I'd like to ask, um, in the original EVP investment note on ClearCouts, there's a story about this uh, character, let's say, of uh, Grandpa Lenny. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, that story? Uh, yeah, for sure. And I think, um, you know, Julian's referring to there when we do an investment, we kind of share publicly a little bit of the thinking behind it as a bit of a, you know, here's some of the softer side of why we made the investment. And, um, you know, in that article, I referenced Grandpa Lenny, who I promise you is a real person, not a cartoon character, but uh, he, uh, He's uh, still doing well. I saw him on the weekend. He's 102 now, um, but he was a, um, a kind of engineer, more of a civil engineer, kind of, to be honest, a bit town planner, but I think doing a lot of the same calculations that ClearCouts facilitates today. And um, hey, Brooks, good to see you. Um, and uh, yeah, I suppose growing up, just hanging out at his apartment, there's like he had, he still has it, all the this bookshelf with a thousand bloody thick textbooks of calculations that I couldn't understand when I was six and I still can't understand today. Um, but I suppose um, having an idea, you know, through stories from him of how, you know, engineering calculations used to be done literally in the 1930s when he was kind of studying and going through his university days. Um, and then hearing, I suppose, when we got to know Chris over a couple of years before investing, the fact that it kind of hadn't changed much in a kind of whatever that was at that time, a 95-year period, um, I suppose just spoke to the opportunity. You know, when, when we're looking to make an investment, a big part of it is, does this business have the opportunity for really rapid exponential growth over time? And that typically comes because there's disruption. There's something so fundamentally different about the solution that you're providing to your customer base compared to what you're otherwise doing that people take on the, the product really, really quickly. And there's that real kind of uh, momentum behind a new way of doing business in an industry. So you do want to see that real new way of doing business. And in ClearCalcs, there was certainly a very new way of doing business compared to the alternative and you know, the moniker generally in venture circles is you kind of often need the solution to be 10x better compared to what people are otherwise doing because, you know, they're in their old habits and they've got their old way of scribbling calculations on a piece of paper that's hard to break. And I suppose in, you know, looking at the old school version with textbooks and pens and paper, uh, Excel add-ins and the like, and then just some of the, the um, excuse my language here, but some of the crappy other software solutions mm -hmm. that had come to market over the last little while, I suppose that whole story gave us conviction that there you know, was really something disruptive about what you guys are up to at ClearCalcs. Um, as a follow-up question, I was, I was curious about the, uh, the medium of an investment note. Is that, does that have a role within EVP itself? Uh, like, you know, uh, does a memo actually play a role within the investment process within EVP? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So I suppose, um, I mean, it's probably worth giving you a broader view of what our investment process actually looks like. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose the first thing to say is we never, well, sorry, we sometimes do, but very rarely we meet the founder and then make the investment um, within kind of a short period of time. Uh, just stylistically, you know, the people around the business are really, really central to our investment thesis. So you like to get to know people for a reasonable period of time before pulling the trigger, um, which was certainly the case here. As I said, we met Chris, I think, when he was first going through Startmate um, with Steve and some of the folks around the table as well here. Um, and then I think we only actually invested probably 18 months or two years after that, um, which is pretty standard. 
um, that I suppose, you know, there's that period of dating or getting to know each other, I suppose. Uh, and then there's a shorter, more concentrated version of it leading up to the actual investment. And a lot of the inquiries you do during that culminates in, in an investment paper. It's a little bit similar to the kind of public Grandpa Lenny memo that may have gone out, but uh, it's a little bit more in depth with numbers and looking at you know historical growth, forecast growth, conversion rates, international traction, it's, uh, unit economics, all the good stuff you guys focus on operationally inside the business today. Uh, we take a really close look at um, from the EVP side of things to get a sense of, I mean, all, all that analysis is really trying to speak to this idea of product market fit and is there you know a really big pull from the market um, from a customer base that's going to use the product more and more over time and stick around forever and that's the underpinnings of a really valuable business so i suppose we have a paper speaking to that which half of its numbers and then half of it's the qualitative stuff a little bit similar to what was in the public memo but just speaking to uh you know the long-term opportunity the people behind the business some of the more qualitative aspects to it so it's a typically a probably a 25 page paper that we kind of share internally. We debate pretty furiously internally um, before we then uh, maybe un- unfairly invite the likes of Chris to come present to the wider EVP team. So it's not just, you know, we, Justin and I were the ones that got to know Chris and Steve um, over the journey um, when we're getting to know the business. But at the end of the day, it's a kind of joint EVP investment decision. So we kind of, um, you know, get Chris and Steve to come present in their words why ClearCalx is really great so that our team can hear from them uh, and equally give Chris and Steve the opportunity to not just meet us and grill us on why EVP is a reasonable bunch of people to work with, but get the opportunity to speak to everyone else. So um, that's, I guess, the whole general process where that paper is a big part of it. One of the things I, I heard of uh, from listening to various podcasts and, and whatnot, there was a particular VC from a particular firm who spoke to the concept of pounding the table. So I think this was early stage, so maybe not quite relevant for today, but um, he was saying that you know that when he would meet a particular founder that he was so convinced on, he had like one opportunity in a year to pound the table and say, I want to bet on the, uh, I want to, stand for this this startup or this idea um and then you spoke to the topic of hard conversations within evp is that uh, just trying to understand a little bit better around like when you write a paper and then how do you actually what's the internal processes around that like it's like yeah no happy to touch on it and that person's maths is correct like if i think about evp the firm we have, I mean, realistically, the number of people that are leading investments is probably seven of us. Mm-hmm. And we do roughly seven investments a year. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're not realistically going to be doing more than probably two a year as an individual person. Mm-hmm. Um, you might, but it's unlikely. So, uh, you know, we as a team see a thousand deals a year or opportunities a year of which you probably take a close look at 100. Um, so it's a lot of filtering down to find the one you really want to you know, put your name against and you know, bang the table about. And it's a long journey, right? Like when you've made the decision to partner up, uh, you're stuck with us for 10 years and we're stuck with you for 10 years. It's not a, it's not a light decision to make. It's kind of a, a business of a small number of very important decisions that you have to really get right. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, so it is a big thing. So as I mentioned, we kind of prepare the, all the information people need to be able to have a discussion uh, on the EVP side, and then it is a it's a hard it's a hard thrashed out discussion, and you typically have a couple of people championing the deal um, and banging the table, as you say. Saying, this is why it's a great investment. This is why it's um, you know going to go really well, and we're all going to make a lot of money out of this. Um, and then it's the responsibility of the other folks around the table to challenge that, right? And it's not out of, because we think you're idiots, the people that have brought you know, this business to the table, it's out of you know, really testing the, you know, testing the thinking, testing the assumptions, testing the historical performance, testing market size, all that sort of stuff. And it's a bit of, um, yeah, it's a little bit of, you know, it's never directed at the person, but you're, you're throwing it around properly. <laughs> it's a... Yeah. Um, 
you know, and really challenging and pushing back and kind of testing and prodding. So it's, um, yeah, we typically spend uh, however many hours is required to do that on each individual one. Um, mm -hmm. And then I suppose that primes us to do that final step of, you know, chatting to Chris and Steve in this situation and kind of throwing it around. The question that came to mind was that I read a little bit about, um, Mark, your background uh, from McKinsey and management consulting and how you went from like a 10,000 person org to, uh, to the team at EVP now. Um, was there much training and this sort of dynamic, like from McKinsey going into EVP? Like, how do you navigate these? Uh, this new environment uh it's a good question not much training <laughs> it's uh yeah. you know it's a different world but it's less i suppose you know there's clear difference between being a strategy consultant and investing in startups it is just necessarily a different you know a lot of commonality in the underlying skills but it's a different role but that shift from big business to small business which i assume a bunch of the folks on this call have navigated as well it's a big shift right you go from swimming as one of ten thousand, as you say to like when I joined EVP, there were I was the fifth person, um, which again I know some of you have been inside of Clear Calcs. It's um, it's just different, right? There's no fancy bathrooms, there's no HR, there's no finance, there's no uh, you know you go and cut your own key for the office, um, and all of that was fine. I suppose the bigger difference for me, which took a little while to get around, was um, kind of sitting next to literally touching elbows with everyone in the business. Um, and I suppose finding, you know, people you can have vulnerable conversations with as you're going up in your career and basically just bitch about your day-to-day -day work is a little bit tougher when you're in, when that's the situation. So, you know, a critical part that I think the Australian venture industry at least is really good at is um, just camaraderie across people in similar roles at different funds, um, which I suppose it's a less formal version of mates and mentors. We tried to facilitate on the EVP side of things, but just having those relationships outside of your own business um, to compare notes, to have a bit of a bitch and a whine, I think is um, really, really important. Um, and I suppose, yeah, just the difference where, you know, old world, you could do that inside your company, new world, you kind of have to proactively go and form those relationships, which, um, you know, outside of having a, you know, quasi therapist to go and bitch and whine to, it's also quite important, I suppose, just networking long-term and creating opportunities, which have been really valuable as well. So, I'd say that's probably the other kind of key difference beyond just the, you know, the reality of consulting versus investing over time. I feel like that's because um, in my head, I, I don't know much about management consulting. I've never been there, but I feel like that's quite a mm, contrarian is the word that comes to mind. It's a, like, I don't think, is that a common pathway for people to go to take that route? Like, how did you convince yourself to make that switch? It's a good question. Uh, and then the overlay, I would say, is when I got involved in venture in Australia, uh, there was a lot fewer people trying to do it and a smaller industry. And I probably wouldn't get a job today with the CV I had back then. So anyway, it's probably more timing than anything else. Um, look, the consulting uh, role uh, for all its flaws and all its positives, whatever, it's generally a bunch of people who are unsure what to do with their career. So they go to the most generalist career you possibly can. It's like literally what the hell is a consultant? It doesn't even mean anything. It's just uh, nonsense. Um, and you do, you do a bit of everything. I did kind of pricing work for one company. I did cost out for another company. I did far looking strategy. I did short term stuff. Um, and you just get a varied range of experiences. And, you know, the, the place I was had a pretty clear mission of, yes, serving clients, but also developing in people. So it is kind of, they were pretty open about the fact that, you know, people come into these places, they burn you out for two years, you get crazy experience, but you're probably not going to stick around long term. Um, and that was so, it's pretty common, I suppose, after two years to go either you know the corporate route go work for a bank go work for private equity go work for venture capital go work for a startup go found your startup like it is quite varied in australia weirdly not that many people have taken the venture capital route from consulting there's probably like as i think about the industry there's probably four or five of us um far more have actually gone and started startups some of the folks i used to work with have kind of gone down that path um I don't know if these names mean anything to the people on the call, but the likes of there's a business called Driver in the kind of car finance space in Sydney that was, you know, some folks I used to work with. A friend of mine that I used to work with went and did uh, medical tourism, trying to get Chinese people who need um, certain procedures done in Australia to try and facilitate that. 
um, and a few other things. So whatever, maybe it's just the firm I was working at, but it seems to be a lot more entrepreneurial and, you know, folks like minded with all of you on the call compared to people like me who are maybe just a little bit more risk averse or something like that. And then a little bit of a tangent here, but from the, from some research, um, I read up about how your mom has a background in programming. Um, and can you tell us a little bit more about that story? She trained up in computer programming in university in would have been the late seventies, early eighties, uh, when it was punch card programming, which I, I, I'm not enough of a computer engineer to even know exactly what that means, but essentially you have a bunch of like little paper cards, I believe it was, you punch out specific holes and that tells the, you feed it into a giant computer and it tells the computer what to do. Um, and yeah, she trained up on that way back in the day, I suppose growing up, she, her role was basically designing um, database backend solutions with a kind of lightweight front end solution for magazines to facilitate the advertising that they want to have. So it's kind of just ad inventory dealing with people, the people that do want to advertise. It was specifically a magazine in Australia called Medical Observer, which was kind of a medical professional specific magazine. And she designed their system originally. Then another firm, another magazine approached her to build the solution for them. Um, and knowing what I know now, I would have told her to productize the thing and to have a SaaS solution, but whatever, she didn't do that back in the day. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, it was just like, I never appreciated it growing up, but it would be always, you know, some weird database challenge that you'd be having or thinking about how to link certain tables to other attributes and, you know, how to, you know, set it up nicely from a UX perspective for the kind of, uh, marketing folks inside the magazine to know how to work the system. And it was, um, yeah, just. Growing up with that, it was literally around the dining table and that sort of thing. Just like thrashing out ideas was kind of just a fun thing growing up, I suppose. Were there any other like um, key memories around like your exposure to technology in general? Um, I mean, always just enjoyed computers and that sort of thing growing up, but I wouldn't say more than the the next person. I think the... I mean, that's a growing up thing. The the McKinsey experience in consulting world did really open my eyes to just the opportunity for tech to revolutionize Australia. Like, I don't know how many folks on this table have seen the inside of a corporate, but it is an utter disaster. They're taking the way that they operate. It has a real, real impact on the services provisioned to Australians, and I presume worse so in America um, and Canada and wherever the folks, Georgia, I assume, Laurent, um, I presume don't. <laughs> The best going inside their corporates uh that was a real eye-opener it's kind of i hadn't appreciate i don't know growing up you think the likes of elstra and optus and agl and whatever other corporate you can think of kind of has their shit together excuse my language uh they don't and they need a lot of help <laughs> and it has very real real impacts on uh countries and the world frankly so that was a bit of a an eye-opener if not a um, anything else and I kind of have a little bit of sympathy like you know these firms were probably at the bleeding edge of technology when they set up their systems probably in the 80s when you know computers were starting to become a thing and you could kind of do some of this stuff uh, but there's it's probably a maybe an Australia specific thing where um, you know, it's all oligopolies everywhere and there's no real learning platform to innovate and no one really coming to steal your lunch because you've got this much scale, but there really hasn't been much innovation at all. Like it's still using systems that were built 20 years ago. Um, and as you leave it longer and longer, it's not even just, you know, complacency to not upgrade it. It becomes really bloody hard. So anyway, that was, um, yeah, some shocking stuff you see inside those um, those firms. This um, makes me think about like, um, I'd be curious to hear your opinion on how, like, let's say the Australian, New Zealand um, startup ecosystem has changed over the years. Because mm, my exposure to the system uh, ecosystem, it's you know very limited. And my original assumptions were like, oh, I, I would have to go to the US or Singapore or somewhere other than Australia to be part of startups. But that completely changed as soon as I started digging underneath the surface and discovering more about the companies that are actually here. Um, how have you seen it change or, like in recent years? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. It has changed a lot. I think maybe as a, a framing thing to put it in comparison, 
I was um, chatting with a US investor who I think Chris had the chance to meet as well, a bloke called Vinny who works at a fund called Left Lane Capital out of the US. And he's been doing venture in the US for, I'm going to do the math. I think he's 32, but got in pretty early. So it's probably been, I don't know, eight years or something like that. His comment to me was when he got started, there were 10,000 people working in the US in venture capital. And today there are 100,000. Um, so that's one end of the spectrum. And that's would clearly be the most people of any country working in venture capital. But, you know, to put it in comparison, Australia, I suppose, had a couple of waves of venture funds that over the years that didn't really go anywhere. So there was a bunch that existed in the dot-com era that got completely wiped out and everyone lost their money. Uh, there were a couple, you know, a few firms running around between then and the GFC, which again, didn't really go anywhere and got wiped out. And there really wasn't a venture firm for a long time. Like, sorry, a venture um, industry for a long time. So if you were, you know, you read the the story of the Atlassian folks, they and the reason why they have so they own so much of their company today as a listed behemoth is there weren't venture funds around to give them cash in the early days, and they just had to make do and kind of bootstrap from there. Um, and you know, some of the one of the folks on my team, Les, has kind of been doing tech angel investing since. Uh, late 90s. Um, I think his first one yet was kind of late 90s and a couple of investments early 2000s. He was like him and people like him were were the venture industry. Like the, those were the folks that were kind of investing in early stage startups. And um, there's some names now that have been big successes, but it was random people like that. It wasn't necessarily the venture firms. That all changed a reasonable amount around 2012. Um, and it was you know, part, um, just some pioneering folks had seen the opportunity for venture capital and other geographies that really wanted to give it another crack. And, you know, funds, the, the three funds that kind of really got running at that point were Airtree, SquarePeg and Blackbird, if those names mean anything to you. Um, the other thing that happened around then was the Turnbull government in Australia um, released a bunch of tax um, reforms that made it quite lucrative to, as an investor, to put your money with a venture fund. Um, where uh, it's probably getting too grainy, but basically if you if our investors invest with us, they get their returns capital gains tax free, which is quite significant um, compared to other investment opportunities. They also get a 10 a 10% tax offset of the cash that they invest on the way in. So it's just 10% cash back of whatever money you put place with the fund on the way in. So anyway, it became really, really um, lucrative um, or beneficial to invest via that scheme if you believed in the product. Um, and I suppose with the work of the air tree, square pegs and blackbirds and that um, other, I, I suppose, the successes of the Atlassians of the world that were starting to do really exciting things, you had those three funds and then folks like ourselves as this next generation of funds coming to market. Um, and, you know, when I got involved, there were probably 10 funds of reasonable note at that point. Uh, the industry was probably... 70 people, um, realistically, given the average size of these firms. Uh, and it was very small. It, it was very uncompetitive, which was it's unusual compared to particularly in the US. Of Everyone had their niche. There were enough. It was a complete over. There was a lack of supply and over demand for capital. And uh, people shared deals and figured out who was the right fund for the right company. Uh, and it was really quite collegiate and collaborative, as I was kind of touching on before. Um, and that's, I suppose, what it looked like when I got involved. There was a massive growth in the industry, though, between then and today. Today, there's something like 100 funds um, floating around of various different shapes and sizes, probably 25 or so of reasonable size and scale that you know you look to raise from and a bunch of smaller ones. Um, and yeah, the number of people working in it has probably gone up 2x or 3x or something like that. Um, so it, it has gone through rapid growth, but I suppose the reason for mentioning the US to start, <laughs> it's still laughable, right? Like there might be whatever, two, 300 people working in Australia, um, not the 100,000 in the US. So it's, it still is much smaller, but certainly if you're a founder in Australia, it's probably the best time to be founding a business uh, in history if you're trying to do the kind of venture capital pathway. Uh, but still a long, long way to go for the Australian um, kind of um, fundraising landscape as, as far as founders are concerned. 
Yeah, no, ClickApps is probably a good example of this. Often capital is not the impediment to get running. Um, and if I look at what you guys achieved without a whole bunch of capital to get started, that's probably the pathway more um, founders should be running with because, you know, it's just unnecessary dilution sometimes. And often capital is not the constraint for growth is what we find. It's kind of, um, you know, helpful as you're scaling and you want to make certain bets and certain investments and go on that path. Um, but often through various means, as the likes of Atlassian have shown, uh, you can actually get pretty far without external capital and running a business profitably in the early days. Um, so it's, you know, there was a period there through 2020, 2021, uh, where there was probably a whole bunch of unnecessary capital that was thrown at startups and founders taking it, um, which probably didn't do anyone any favors. Um, there was probably a little bit of unnecessary dilution, a little bit of, um, you know, unnecessary investment, but it's probably a little bit saner today, albeit I, I trust and hope that it's going to continue to grow from here as just a number of companies proliferates rather than the same number of companies taking on more capital, if you know what I mean. Uh, one, one thing that's um, uh, always preoccupied me, having come from structural engineering a couple of years ago into programming, um, was the idea of the build your own calculators. So for me, it feels like it's always been a problem in my structural engineering to create calculators. And we had a chat with Eva, who was another one of our structural engineers yesterday about just a horrendous process that spreadsheets uh, go through in, in these companies um, and modifications of the spreadsheets and the no official version. Um, I guess the question is, what's your perspective from an outsider of hearing about the problem, hearing about what we're trying to do for it and whether we're making a a good bet, a big whether we should go harder into that bet, or whether we should be more cautious. You know, uh, I just want to hear your perspective on the bet that we're making on this. Yeah, no, it's it's a good question. It is a meaty strategic thing to try and work through. I think you look. My personal perspective is you have to think carefully what the purpose of having the calculator builder is. You know, a big part of our investment in ClearCalc specifically was was the builder. Um, the original thinking behind it was uh, you've got a whole bunch of, you know, the Enercal, Strucal, structural toolkits of the world who uh, don't have the benefit of a flexible platform to rapidly generate calculations and are therefore constrained to an individual geography, um, which is fine if it's Enercal and the US is big-ish, but to build a really, really big business, which I think we all have the ambition to do here, global is kind of quite important and potentially multidiscipline, although we'll see where that goes. Um, but for us, the calculator builder in its infancy back then, a lot more developed today is a big part of that is how do you, I suppose, make clear as engineers hyper efficient and hyper scalable to do lots of calculations and expand the library to how do you get other people that may be, I don't know, contracted or whatever it may be to do it as well. And then three, potentially, how do you get the public um, on your journey to expand the library, basically, to serve as big a market as possible, to get as many customers as possible, and to kind of grow really quickly. So from that perspective, it's just fundamentally important from an investment decision and hugely, um, hugely in favor. I think the there's a trickiness of staging and which one of those pathways do you go down first and what does it mean to release it to the public? How do you monetize that? How do you not monetize that? How do you ensure quality assurance and a whole bunch of really tricky questions to work through as we kind of test and learn. Um, but in terms of the investment, certainly, you know, in favor in a big way and really backing the team in terms of, you know, the progress you all have made on that journey is really, really bloody valuable to the company today and long term. So, um, you know, we probably haven't said it. I haven't said it enough on this call, at least. But uh, take it as written. There's uh, uh, immense gratitude from the EVP side of things, certainly from the board more generally, um, for a lot of the hard yards you guys are doing, particularly on the product and dev side of things, to set the business up for the future. I think the reality: all of our companies have competitors. Like, if you meet a founder that says there's no competitor for their solution, they're lying to you. Um, like it's just, just no chance. I suppose the important thing to know is are you operating in a big enough market that, you know, even if there's a competitive dynamic, there's enough kind of market to go after and customers to acquire. 
And two, do you have a really clear understanding of your product, your product edge, some of the nuance of your customers? And do you have the right industry insiders either in your business or around your business to really meet those customer needs in a really fantastic way? Um, so I suppose, I don't know, from the outside in terms of the Victor thing, my sense is that we've got a much more hyper-targeted solution for a very specific type of engineer being the structural engineer as compared to their one, which I believe is a bit more broad and a bit more kind of just calculator generally for engineers and mathematicians. Yeah, interesting. I suppose the comment I was going to make, which I think ties in with what you're saying there, that's great if you've, you know, someone that's like rapidly trying to meet the needs of 20 different people in their org who each have slightly different needs. The challenge obviously is that you're, um, we liked about ClearCouts along with some of the other solutions in our portfolio is, you know, hyper vertical, real clear understanding of a specific user set and meeting their needs in a real way, um, as opposed to building the product and expecting people to come and kind of people changing their ways through the product. Um, so I don't know. I was, I have put money in, but if I was making a bet one way or another, it would be with you guys as opposed to a more generic solution, I suppose. Landing on a couple of last questions I was hoping to ask. Um, this one's about, um, organizational culture. Uh, the thing that prompted this was that when I first joined ClearCalcs, one of the first things I noticed was that it was seen as weird to not have questions. So it was probably like in my first week with the company. And I remember Stephen asking me like, oh, do you have questions? Do you have questions? Are you curious about anything? I was like, no, my brain's overloaded. I don't have questions. I'm just trying to absorb stuff. But that kind of prompted me like, oh, it is acceptable to have questions. It is acceptable to be curious. Uh, so I was, I was curious about uh, in, in your experience so far, like are there any particular green flags when you when it comes to like uh, a healthy organizational culture? That's a very good question. I like the, uh, it's good to hear there's that expectation inside clear calcs. I, yeah. I, I, I presume half the people on this call have already seen it, but I was watching that Oppenheimer movie and then doing a bit of research behind it. And one of the, there's a research organization he was working for that was founded upon the fact that all the great inventions in the history of the world have been based on people exploring things for curiosity as opposed to it being a job necessarily. So as much as, you know, this is a job for you guys, I get it, you're working there. But if you don't have that curiosity, the idea of making breakthroughs and kind of, you know, going down various rabbit holes and kind of, um, you know, Les in my team refers to it as kind of rat cunning and kind of smelling, sniffing things out and kind of going after it and that sort of thing um, is just critical to startup success more broadly, never mind just organizational health. Um, in terms of the actual question, um, yeah, I think it's, and, and I know Chris and Steve are particularly good at this sort of stuff, but, um, you know, giving ownership down to the folks who are kind of at the front clients, speaking to customers, dealing with, um, you know, the actual engineering problems and encouraging that ownership mindset is just critical for these sorts of companies. Um, you guys, I know, are all stretched pretty thin. You're kind of running a million miles an hour. And if you don't have that ownership mindset, you get all sorts of issues between missing opportunities for, um, you know, uh, like revenue opportunity, you know, you're speaking to an engineer and they say something in a conversation and, you know, if you're not jumping on that and understanding some of those like recurring, recurring things and feeding them through the organization, you miss out on that side of things equally, uh, you know, there's the risk side of the equation. And if you notice a bug in code or you notice a calculator that's been built incorrectly, uh, and you don't call it out and you don't act as an owner of the business or a leader in the business um that uh and kind of jump and run with things on that that has kind of massive detrimental impacts though the way i've kind of re uh, heard it referred in the past is and you know this actually from my previous workplace was you know an obligation to dissent and an obligation to call things out if you see that it's wrong or you see that you know something needs to be fixed um i think is where you have an organization where folks are empowered to do that sort of thing um it is you know really really valuable and I, I know you guys are actually really good at that compared to some of the other companies we work with so i'd encourage you to continue doing it um but yeah I, I would say and this is you know a bit of a um you know hat tip to chris and steve on this front um clear counts for its stage of business has uh, an unusually high focus on organizational culture on career development on all these different elements 
Um, like they, the, the leaders you've got in front of you are actually very, very good at that sort of stuff. More typically, it's, uh, you know, the founder that doesn't have time to care too much about the employees and, you know, you're running a million miles an hour and then suddenly you turn around and you've got a team of 30 and you haven't ever thought about values or culture or professional development or career pathways or X, Y, and Z, uh, and you're playing catch up. Um, and it has really bad effects because scaling from that point in time gets really hard if you don't have those foundations in place. But so I think in this situation, you guys have got the foundations right early and you're kind of really well set up for that scaling ahead. Um, and it's total credit just to the people in the business that have kind of taken it upon themselves to say, this is something I care about. This is something that's important. And this is something we want to get right early. So, um, as much as that's not a whole bunch of outside stuff that you guys could improve on, I think it's probably more of a hat tip that you're actually doing a whole bunch right on that organizational health stuff for a business of this scale. Just to follow up that thought, what is clear Calx's standout amongst the EVP portfolio? Like when you talk to, when other people that aren't you on our board go, I really like the look of clear Calx because X, Y, Z from EVP. What is like at the top of that list? uh that's a good question well, i think what would we be remembered for in evp if nothing else uh that's a very good question i think look there's the number side of it which people get excited about mm-hmm. the next number of customers and this growth but i don't think that's necessarily the answer you're looking for there but the there's there is that stuff i was touching on and kind of just really good practices org side of things um i'd say the other one and it's you know again credit to the leaders there's a really healthy balance of uh, almost innovation and not sitting on your, your laurels. Like the fact that you early on are having the conversation about the calculator builder versus just building more rigid software that some of your competitors are doing is credit that you're able to look around corners and see further into the future. The fact you're having conversations about, you know, it, it's unusual for me that you know, it's all, it's always kind of revealed after we've done it, but it's kind of like, oh, we did standards. We talked about that when we were initially whiteboarding um, clear gaps. And it's like, <laughs> oh, we're doing the calculator builder. It's like, yeah, we've been thinking about that for five years. But just having that vision early on and a really clear path in your minds is probably uh, not all found. It, it's critical, to be honest, for the success of a business for a founder to be able to do that and to see around corners and to sniff out opportunities. But uh you guys are particularly good at that, I would say, and there is a very clear agenda going forward and a very clear set of options um, for the future to choose from. Okay. Um, I think this might be a good point to open up for any further Q&A. Uh, there is one particular question that has come through from the group beforehand. And this one's about AI. Uh, what is your advice to portfolio companies about AI product features? Are Series A investors looking to see AI product features or is it just a fad? It's a good question. Uh, I think it's kind of AI to what to what end is really like for, for us. And this might be an EVP specific thing. We're not, uh, our investing is into typically new applications of existing technologies. Like for us, there's no point using Frontier Tech for the sake of using Frontier Tech. It's not what we're about. It's kind of a clear understanding of the purpose. So, I mean, the conversation is always how do we get more efficient? How do we grow faster? If there's a new technology around that helps us to do that, certainly we're encouraging people to widen the aperture and think, hey, new technology, new tools coming to market, how do we do that much better? Um, So certainly if you're seeing, you know, the obvious ones that people are starting to embed into the companies is around customer success and how do you kind of, you know, do your next next best action stuff based on, you know, the queries coming in and how do you just improve efficiency on that front? Um, There's some stuff in the marketing stack that's getting much better with um, with some of this AI stuff and a few different use cases there. There's the more fundamental version of that, I suppose, which is for some businesses um, which are very content heavy, uh, it can be like the current environment can be quite disruptive. And, you know, it's an interesting one for ClearCalcs to think about because I don't think we're content heavy necessarily, but content is part of our world. And how do we, uh, you know, use tech to, I see it as an opportunity, not a threat for us, frankly, but how do we more rapidly publish that universe of calculations of which, you know, today we're only doing a small sliver. But for other businesses who aren't as fortunate where it's, 
you know, there's a business I was um, chatting to yesterday where uh, it's actually a style competitor, competitor, um, style education competitor, you know, for that sort of a business where you literally have teachers on staff publishing uh, courses and that's your defensive most. And the fact that you've got this huge curriculum, uh, that's a scary place to be, right? Like the fact that everyone else can just publish really rapidly or a business like Go One, if anyone's uh, across that business out of Queensland, um, where it's kind of business training stuff. There's a lot of stress and panic in the boardrooms of those companies because, you know, the defensive moat and that sort of thing has been rapidly disrupted. So I suppose that's beyond the, uh, I suppose, more operational opportunities or strategic opportunities for some, I suppose, from the venture standpoint, there's just a bit of a rethink really clearly of, um, you know, what is the value proposition? What is that disruptive nature for this business? What's the moat? Why is it defensible? Thankfully, ClearCouse is a really good answer for that because it's much more about the workflow stuff and getting you know people, your customers, to just improve the way they do work day to day, as opposed to necessarily just the library. Um, but for some businesses, it's a hell of a lot more scary than that. I had a question yeah. here. Um, yes. I think for for our team, one thing that we focused on a lot in the last couple of months is really getting closer to our customers and and understanding what their needs are, what they want, how we can best serve them. And I'm curious from your perspective, Mark. Um, you've got people investing, I guess it could be like your, your customers. Um, how do you connect with them? I guess, how do you get their feedback? How do you incorporate that in your say investing strategy? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So, um, so we have an investor base of about 600 individual investors, something like that. Um, and it's their money, frankly, that we've invested into clean counts and other people. So they are really, really important in our world. Um, most, Venture funds in Australia, at least, or some of the bigger ones and around the world, is a very different strategy. You have a smaller number of much larger invest investors. So, you know, some of the Australian venture funds, it's superannuation money. It's all our money, I guess, that's being thrown into venture funds and uh, people, just corporates writing large checks, basically, to give venture funds money to go and invest. We've taken a very different approach. So, you know, the, the start of EVP, I was kind of touching on some folks on the team have been doing tech investing for much longer than we've had a fund and it was kind of angel investing personal investing um through you know fortunately some of those angel investments went really really well um these names may not mean, mean anything to you but the likes of sitemindr uh, hotel club ship it a few others um deputy have kind of grown up to be really large tech success stories and basically the genesis of evp was a bit of a follow me thing of um you know, people wanting to invest alongside the people that founded EVP anyway um, and looking for opportunities to partner up. And it really was, you know, our first fund was friends and family. Like there was no, it was really people we already knew. Uh, and we've tried to stay true to that long term. So um, we haven't gone down the path of raising superannuation money or any other institutional capital. It's all high net worth individuals, um, a couple of kind of wealth advisory firms who bring all their clients on board with us. Uh, but it is trying to stay true to, you know, a personal interaction with someone on the other end of the phone that we know and we're kind of carrying the weight and the stress of their money um, when we're deploying it, which frankly I think leads to better outcomes and better investment decisioning as opposed to it just being this black box of Host Plus or Unisuper or whoever it is that's giving money. Um, but, yeah, it is largely... Uh, Initially, friends and family, and then it became friends of friends, and it's kind of just proliferated uh, wider and wider on that front. So it's, uh, I feel sorry for the bloke on my team who has to manage the compliance and all the stress of managing 600 investors, but I suppose it's, um, anyway, the same as you guys managing how many customers you have today, which is probably even more of a pain in the ass. But um, anyway, that's, I suppose that's a bit about the investor base. I had a question. Let's say that uh, everything is successful. What's your vision for where this company is in 10 years, right? What does the world look like? It's a good question. I think, um, I suppose there's a few elements to it, right? Like there's the customer element, there's the product element, there's the employee element, there's the us element, uh, like investor element, I suppose. Um Look, I think the the vision is probably, I mean, the best archetype I have is a business like SiteMinder. Um, so SiteMinder was one of those businesses I've mentioned Les invested in on my team 13 years ago when it was two people in a garage. Um, they provide um, 
basically software for hotels to manage the rooms they sell on online travel agencies. So if you're mm-hmm. a hotel and you want to sell across booking.com and Expedia and wherever else you want to sell it, it's really hard to manage what inventory and which rooms you're kind of selling on which platform and what price each platform shows, et cetera, et cetera. And they provide software to help do that. Um, as I said, that was so that was 13 years ago. So whatever, pretend we're, yeah, it kind of matches up to where they are today. Um, for the 10-year vision, Chris, you're asking about, you know, today they're a 140 million ARR business. They listed about a year ago, which is less important for me in terms of where the business goes long term. Um, very large customer base. Importantly, still a whole bunch of the early folks still involved, which I think is really critical. They've continued to iterate over that period of time product-wise to continue meeting the needs of their customers and just being a trusted advisor. And I think importantly, similar to ClearCalc, they've got really excellent long-term uh, customer retention. So, you know, you might have a bit of churn up front of folks that are figuring out whether it's the right product for them, but there's a really sticky customer base that grows to rely, trust the product and use it more and more over time. So, you know, it might not be the sexiest answer, but frankly, that journey of, you know, iterative product building, iterative customer acquisition, having, you know, folks around the team that really are inspired and have become the leaders long term of that business, um, all those elements, I suppose, come into it. Like a, a nice story there, and it's probably relevant for you folks around the table here, is there was a bloke there, Di Williams, who joined. He was probably employee number 10 or something. He... um he wrote it all the way through. He did 17 different bloody roles in that organization between product and sales and marketing and operations. Um, I think his final role was like head of growth or something like that. But, you know, at some point he was figuring out the Stripe integration. At some point he was managing a global sales team, but he kind of grew really nicely with the company, which was critical for culture long term. It was critical for, you know, hiring and figuring out the right people and institutional knowledge so he can make the right strategic calls. And, you know, he went all the way through listing. I think he left about six months ago or something to go join some new startup for his sins. But um, he, I suppose that for me is real success. Like folks that want to stick around with the business, grow with the business, generate wealth, improve their, you know, real amazing career outcomes, you know, as they're building their career um, by virtue of going on a really exciting growth journey with an individual company that is going through that exponential growth. That for me is success. That for me is kind of what looks really great and the opportunity I see for ClickOps, the business, as well as all of you kind of around the table here today. And it's, um, you know, they're probably the outlier in the portfolio getting to that 150 million ARR or whatever it is today. But certainly we've seen the path repeatedly now of that journey from, you know, a million ARR or a bit ahead of that where you guys are today. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard yakka and it doesn't just happen overnight. It's kind of get rich slow, but it's, you know, one to two to three to five to 10, you know, you can build a really, really great business growing 70% every year, you know, a business like Ignition in our portfolio, never grown faster than 80% year on year and never grown slower than whatever, 50% year on year on the ARR stuff. But you do that for 10 years and compound that growth, you end up with a very large business on the other end of the thing. They're now about 30 million ARR um, or 45 million gross, depending on how you classify some of their revenue. Um, Like that's how we build long-term businesses. That for me is success as opposed to some of the hypey nonsense that's otherwise out there. And it's a lot about the people around the table that make that, make that success a reality. Love it. Awesome. We've got a minute left, so we're just on time, actually. So uh, I'll take this opportunity to thank you, Mark, for sharing your time with us uh, this morning. No, thank you. Like, really, it's uh, we don't get enough of an opportunity to hang out with all of you, but um, take it as read. You guys are doing the hard yakka. We appreciate it. Um, it's kind of, you know, you're achieving really amazing things, be it on the product side, on the growth side, continually learning. Um and we're all certainly around the board table really excited for what the next couple of years look like ahead. So just big thank you. Really good to see you all. And as a plug, I know you guys are all over the mates and mentor stuff, but outside of that, if there's any opportunity to help as EVP or the board generally, seriously, shout out anytime. Always happy to have a chat, make a connection, share a thought that may be worthless or just be an ear on the other end of the phone. I'm really happy to do that anytime. Just reach out. Love it. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thanks, everyone.